Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about the Abraham Accord. That new peace deal between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Trump on yesterday, August the 13th, announces his huge breakthrough peace deal. And he's calling it the Abrahamic Accord. Now, the reason why I'm taking so much interest in this is because of the peace and safety prophecy. You don't hear them guys saying peace and safety too much. What they say is peace and security. So I went in to find a translation of the Bible which says peace and security. And when you know there is actually scripture that says peace and security in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 3. Now this is the English standard version no doubt. But what it says is while they are saying there is peace and security then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape see this is what all of the excitement is about when you talk about the Middle Eastern peace deal of course they've been working on this for decades they even gave President Obama the Nobel Peace Prize because they thought that he would be the one to get this deal signed but he didn't leaving it up to the true 44th president Donald J Trump in order to get it signed and he seems to be making headway this Abraham Accord promises peace and safety between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and it should be noted that Iran Turkey Libya and Jordan are rejecting the idea of this peace treaty they want nothing to do with it so there's a lot going on with this not only is it 2020 which seems to be off the chain anyway but now you're talking about this deal of the century which has got several people talking about Donald Trump receiving the peace award which if he could actually pull it off and create peace in the Middle East he would deserve that peace award the problem comes in when you look at what scripture says will happen when they start saying that they have peace and safety or peace and security it says sudden destruction will come upon them now it appears that the signing of this peace deal hasn't taken place yet and won't take place until the cusp of the November election so right before the November election we can expect Donald J Trump Netanyahu Mahmoud Abbas or whoever is over the United Arab Emirates to all get together and sign this Abraham Accord so you can imagine while they're all passing out the pens that they used to sign this document and patting each other on the back and shaking hands for their camera ops saying we now have peace and security sudden destruction will be right around the corner so what exactly is this sudden destruction is it World War three well I think more clues are given in this verse here it says the sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come up on a pregnant woman and they will not escape so when I'm looking in my reference Bible as it's talking about labor pains as a pregnant woman the reference Bible points me to Isaiah in chapter 13 particularly verses 6 through 9 you see right there in verse 8 when it says a woman that travaileth the whole verse says and they shall be afraid pains and sorrows shall take hold of them they shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth they shall be amazed one at another their faces shall be as flames so this is using the same language as first Thessalonians in chapter 5 
And when you look up here at verse 6 of Isaiah chapter 13, you see that this travailing of this pregnant woman is tied to the day of the Lord. And right after it finished talking about the travailing woman there in verse 8, verse 9 says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate and to destroy the sinners thereof out of it. This sounds like Jerusalem, where it's talking about lay the land desolate. Now, it's already desolate of all Israelites. They left during the abomination of desolation back there in 685. The Dome of the Rock, as described in the book of Daniel, chapter 12. Let he that readeth understand. But now, that land, the Holy Land, is about to become desolate of all inhabitants. The way I understand it, nobody's going to live there ever again. Even more of the timing related to all of this can be seen down here in verse 10. When it's talking about the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. We see the same event talked about all over the Bible signaling the day of the Lord. Well, we can see here in Isaiah chapter 13 that is also tied to this woman that travaileth, which is placed in direct connection with the peace and security of the Abraham Accord. Now, we're already getting hints from Daniel related to some event taking place over there in Jerusalem during the year 2020. To briefly show you what I mean, looking over at this time chart of human history, we can quickly see that the 70 years of captivity started in 606 BC. That is the year that Nebuchadnezzar and his troops went in and burned Jerusalem during the 10th of Av and took all of the material used to make the daily sacrifice back into Jerusalem. That is what's being talked about over in Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 when Daniel is told that from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up there shall be 1,290 days. Now, of course, he's talking about years when he says 1,290 days. So if you add 1,290 years from 606 B.C., adding an additional year because there is no year zero, you end up in the year 685 A.D., which is the year that the Dome of the Rock was built on the Temple Mount. That is the abomination that maketh desolate. Abomination because it was built to a whole nother God that maketh desolate because all of the Israelites fled Jerusalem during that time. Now if you go one verse further, he's talking about a blessing that will occur on the 1335th day. So if you add 1,335 years from 685, you end up in the year 2020, which, of course, is perfect timing if, in fact, Donald Trump gets this peace and security deal signed as he intends to there in November. There is already a lot going on in this year, more spiritually than physically. But it is these physical events that will signal the greater spiritual events that are yet to take place. So we pay attention to things like announcements of peace and security or peace and safety. So what do we do in the meantime? From what I understand, Donald Trump, Israel, and the United Arab Emirates are all supposed to get together and sign this Abraham Accord in November or late October. That takes us to the other side of the fall feast of 2020. Rosh Hashanah or the Memorial of Blowing of Trumpets. Yom Kippur 
or Atonement Day 2020, and Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles will all have occurred before the signing of the Abraham Accord. Now this is great news. This gives us even more time to get right with the Lord before that great and dreadful day gets here. We can study his covenant, which is Exodus chapter 20 through 23. We can learn the shepherd of Hermas and how to take on our father's virtues and reject those wicked powers that control man alongside the principalities. And one of the most important things is we can celebrate those statutes, those fall feast days. And I say that that's important because we see over here in second Esdras and chapter two that we are sealed at the Lord's feast. Verse 38 says, arise and stand up and see the number of those who have been sealed at the Lord's feast. This is talking about those who withdrew themselves from the shadow of the world and have received the glorious garments from the Lord. This, I believe, is what's being talked about over in the book of Revelation in chapter 7. It's talking about these four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree. This is talking about destruction. But you look at verse 2 of chapter 7, and it says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So we learn over in Second Ezra that we receive the seal at the Lord's feast. Because not only is he going to seal those of the 12 tribes, the 144,000. But you see also at the end of the chapter, that multitude that no man can number is also sealed in chapter 7. So the father's people will be keeping the feast of the Lord as always. Before this announcement of peace and security takes place, right before we get the woman travailing with birth pains, right before the day of the Lord. So what should we be doing in the meantime? We should be keeping the feast of the Lord. We're over here in Leviticus in chapter 23 and we can see the feast of the Lord, not the feast of the Jews. In Leviticus 23, we see the Sabbath day mentioned along with seven holy convocations, which make up the Feast of the Lord. Now, of course, you've heard of ones like Passover and Unleavened Bread and First Fruits. Those happen in the spring. It is when we get down here to 23 that we start hearing about the fall feast, Leviticus 23 and 23. For those who like numerology. We start to hear about the fall feast. The first up, which is on the seventh month and the first day of the month is a memorial of blowing of trumpets. It is a holy convocation. We're told to do no work on that day. No hard work, servile work. You can look that word up and we should do an offering made by fire. That's on the memorial of blowing of trumpets. So on that day, you would want to take off work. Like I said, you would do no servile work that day unless you could go to work without actually working. Then you need to put in an application for leave. It starts on September the 18th at the evening time. So as the sun goes down on Friday, September the 18th, we will start the memorial of blowing of trumpets, letting everybody know that not only has a new month started, but we have also started the fall feast months and the new civil year. So you want to take off that Saturday and do an offering made by fire. Then in verse 26 of Leviticus 23, we start to hear about the day of atonement. 
the tenth day of the seventh month there shall be a day of atonement this is the day that we shall afflict our souls an offering offering made by fire unto the Lord verse 28 says we shall do no work therein for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God now notice the difference in the work that we could do during this holy convocation whereas the memorial of blowing of trumpets said that we could not do any servile work the day of atonement we are told we cannot do no work so you say what's the difference between servile work and no work now we'll be putting out more classes that we as we get closer to that holy day but in the meantime you could just look up the word servile and I think you'll get an understanding of what it's talking about here here he's saying you can't do any hard labor while down here on atonement day you're told not to do any labor whatsoever down here in verse 30 it says and whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day that same soul will I destroy from among his people so you definitely want to take off work on this day and don't be messing around because what constitutes work he's saying that if you do any work on atonement day you will be destroyed from among the people now this is different from 29 where it says he shall be cut off from among the people in verse 30 they're getting destroyed for work but in verse 29 they're being cut off and why are they being cut off for not afflicting the soul now we can learn what he means by afflicting the soul over in Isaiah chapter 58 Isaiah tells us in our father's words what it means to afflict the soul it doesn't really have anything to do with abstaining from food and water as we have been taught so I would suggest you go over and look at Isaiah chapter 58 which is the only place in the scripture that tells you how to afflict your soul and learn how it is or what it is we are expected to do on atonement day we do not want to be cut off from our people so we should be learning what it is that we are supposed to be doing on that day atonement day will be the day that we'll be dealing the bread to the hungry bringing the poor into our homes clothing the naked loosening the bands of wickedness undoing heavy burdens and letting the oppressed go free that is what we are supposed to be doing on atonement day and when is it it starts on Sunday evening September the 27th so it'll be the whole day of Monday September the 28th until the Sun goes down so many of us actually do need to take the day off work on that day Monday and plan ahead making sure we are both afflicting our souls and abstaining from work there's a lot going on and we definitely don't want to put ourselves in a position to be cut off nor destroyed for not doing what we're supposed to be doing on this day and this is why I want to tell you guys like I said I always like to tell you guys what it is that we're expected to do I often seem like it is my God-given mission to tell you guys because even I went a long time without knowing what it was that I was supposed to be doing on this day. I've been keeping atonement day for a long time, but until our father showed me Isaiah chapter 58, I was doing it incorrectly. And then the last of the fall feasts is the one they call booths or tabernacles or sukkah. It starts the evening of Friday, October the 2nd, and lasts for an entire week, even eight days. We see that one starting here, at verse 33 of Leviticus 23. But before I jump down and talk about this one, I just noticed up here in verse 32, something jumped out at me on how it is actually a Sabbath day. So how do you keep a Sabbath day? and afflict your soul at the same time praying you do a lot of praying for people 
praying for other people is a way of afflicting our souls and a way of doing charitable deeds for our brother even when they're not close enough for us to touch them we can actually do stuff for them by praying for them and that is a way that we can be both honoring the sabbath day and afflicting our souls and if there's great turmoil going around in the world during that time, you could imagine we'll spend a lot of time praying for those individuals that may be f suffering through some of those events. Unless, of course, they're going on in our neighborhood, then we'll actually go out and get in the trenches and try to help some of those people out. Anything can happen on these days. Earthquakes, volcanoes. So... If we're given the opportunity to go out and physically help somebody, we will do so. But if the physical opportunity is not readily available, then we'll spend our time praying for those individuals who are absent. But anyway, just an aside note, the next one we're talking about is the 15th day of the seventh month, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. And it lasts for seven days unto the Lord. The first day is a holy convocation. It falls on a Sabbath day. The 15th of the month is a Sabbath day. And the first date of tabernacles starts on a Sabbath day as it do every year. So it is a holy convocation and you shall do no servile work therein. Now many of us won't have a problem getting the day off on Saturday. But some of us will actually have to let our bosses know that we would need to take off Saturday, October the 3rd, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. It says, seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So this is important to note, is that you're not taking off the entire week. You're making an offering made by fire the entire week, but you're really only taking off the first day and the eighth day. You see right here it says on the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation unto you. That is a, another Sabbath day at the end of the week long feast of booths that you will honor. That one will occur on the 22nd of the seventh month. So that would be Saturday October the 10th that you would have that day off. Starting on the evening of October the 9th. And last into the sun goes down on October the 10th will be a holy convocation. It says you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly and you should do no work therein. Now, this is where the book gets a little bit confusing, I must say. I got confused on this one year because of how there's a break in the instructions on what we are supposed to do that day. You see how verse 37 seems to change gears and it says these are the feast of the Lord which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. But then when you come down here and you look at verse 39 and he says also in the 15th day of the seventh month when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days and on the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. So this is talking about the exact same days. The 15th day of the month lasting for one week, and an eighth day celebration. But it appears to be different. Up here in verse 36, it's saying that it shall be a holy convocation. You shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work. Well, those are the only instructions we're given up there. But then when you look down here, it's saying that it is a Sabbath day, the first day and the eighth day. It's saying that you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. So this seems to be a different kind of feast altogether. And I, like I said a few minutes ago, it is a bit confusing. I did get confused on this one year where I didn't do all of this stuff that's talked about down here I only did what's talked about up there in verse 36 and that was one of the biggest mistakes I've made in this spiritual walk it was like I cursed myself for an entire year because I didn't do this stuff down here let's go on and see what it says see down here 
And ye shall take you on the first day boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So you can imagine people out there with the tree branches walking around singing songs on this day. That's part of the celebration that goes on during that time. Verse 41 says, And you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statue forever in all your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Now, this is unique to all of these when it says that you will do it forever. We was never supposed to stop these feast days. But look at this part right here in verse 42. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelite born shall dwell in booths. See, I'm Israelite born. So I was supposed to be in a booth. But that one year that I said I got confused and only did the solemn feast celebration, I did not sleep in a tent that year. And the whole following year, 365 days following that event was horrible. All kinds of stuff went wrong for me that year. So I say all of that to say that we should be preparing for these feasts. There's a lot going on outside of the year 2020 and that we're supposed to be keeping these feasts. But in the year 2020 and forward, we need to be making sure that we stay doing these feasts that we never stop throughout our generations forever and ever. So I just wanted to share that with you guys, give you a little bit of heads up and make sure you understand what it is that we're supposed to be doing to get prepared for these days, peace and security days. If you got something out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, go ahead and hit the dislike button. Leave us a comment either way. And may our Father bless you and keep you. May our Father make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace.